to all of you in the US or maybe good morning to those of you outside of the US. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here hosting EdChat Interactive tonight. Uh, our guest tonight is uh, Scott McLeod, who uh, writes an interest, really fascinating blog posts and uh, an interesting book, Different Schools for a Different World. Uh, the topic is, are your children's classes dangerously, dangerously irrelevant and what to do about it? Um, so, uh, our philosophy at EdChat Interactive is a little bit different from most other webinars. I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Uh, we want to align um, the way we present information much closer to the way adults learn. And that means that we, we want to make sure that you all have a chance to interact, that you can reflect, and that you can participate. Because we think that that's going to lead to you all learning more and learning better. So uh, to do that, we've created, we've created, we've, we're using a platform called Shindig. And I'd like to go through a couple of the features in Shindig that allow you to interact. Um, if you notice on the bottom of your screen is, is, a, is a menu. Uh, towards the left is something called text chat. That's, that's a box. Now, if you could all click on that for a moment, and I'll show you what the screen with the screenshot what that's going to look like is you'll get a text box um, that text box may currently be obliterating uh, you know the the, the screen um, but you can move it around because if you grab the top of it you can move the text box around you could close it uh, you could shrink it but while the text box is open um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to introduce yourself and uh, maybe ask some question of Scott while you're there or a question of the other participants. And by the way, if you see a question and you have a comment on that question, feel free to interact with that question also. So this is really the first way of interacting is, to, is through this text chat, which uh, people here can see. So let me just go back to the menu again. And the second way of interacting is asking a question. So if you have a question, uh, could be for Scott or it could be for me, uh, you can click on the ask question. That then comes to me. If it's a question that I can answer, I'll ask, I'll answer it. If it's a question for Scott, I'll pass the question along to him and, and, and he can answer it. Now, the third way of interacting is to actually come up on stage the way I am now. And so there's going to be times when Scott says, hey, you know, here's a point that we just made. Who would like to talk about how this might apply in their classroom? Or who has an example of something like this? In which case, you'll click on the raise hand button and we'll bring you up on the stage and and, and talk to Scott. That's actually a lot of fun. So I'd like to encourage all of you to uh, to raise your hand and, and, and come up on stage and interact with Scott um, and maybe with me. And then uh, the, uh, the final way of interacting is to click on the avatar of another person. And when you click on another person's avatar, you end up doing a private video chat with that person. And so, um, you, you need a microphone in order to do that. Um, it's also nice to have a video camera so you can see each other, but the microphone is the part that's essential. I'd like to encourage you to do that now. And what what I'd like you to ask, to ask you to do is to click on somebody's avatar, um, introduce yourself, talk to that person about what you hope to learn, find out what they hope to learn, and, and maybe offer some insights. So I'm gonna pull myself down for a minute. You'll also see that one of the people here is Scott. So you could actually click on him and introduce yourself directly to Scott. Uh, so I'll give you a minute or two to do, to do that. I'm gonna pull myself down. And when I come back up, um, we'll be ready to start. Well, that was really mostly the practice time to do that. And I see that a number of you have had, had a chance to, to try that out. So let me just go through again, the, um, the different ways of interacting text chat, which is, uh, let me let me expand this a second so you can really see it, see that. Text chat, which allows you to uh, text with everybody else who's here. Ask questions, which ask a question of me, and then I pass the question. Um, coming up on stage by raising your hand, that lets me know that, you, that you're willing to come up on stage. And then the final one that a number of you were, were doing is to uh, click on the avatar of another person, 
and to have a private talk with that other person. We'll be doing that a few times too in the course of the evening because we may uh, we may be asking you questions like talk, find somebody else, pair up, and talk to another person about uh, how you might apply this in your school. Um, I'll, let me just go through uh, some of the things that are coming up with EdChat Interactive. On, um, on February 7th, we're having a brand new type of EdChat Interactive. Um, as you know, Tuesday nights is the EdChat hashtag. On February 7th, we're going to take the some of the questions that were raised on the Tuesday EdChat, and we're going to have a discussion on EdChat Interactive about those questions. So we can get we can dive deeper into the questions, and we can get um, uh, more interaction among you all about how you um, how you see those questions, how they apply in your schools, um, and what you're doing about them. So that should be that should be interesting. Uh, we're going to be try we're going to start doing that every month. And then on February 13th, we're going to have uh, Nancy Mangum and Marianne Wolf coming back. Uh, they're talking, uh, they're from the Friday Institute, and they're going to be talking about empowering students and learner agency. Uh, their session last week was, was, was incredible. And I'll be posting the archive of that up uh, probably tomorrow. So you, you can look at their archive as well. But uh, please uh, sign up for these two events that are coming up. And now, without further ado, uh, let me bring up Scott and let me bring him up, up on stage here. And and here he comes. Hey, Scott. Hey, everybody. So welcome to EdShed Interactive. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we were able to make it. Um, and uh, so I'm just, you know, how cold is it in Colorado now? Oh, not at all. It's like 50. Wow, 50 degrees? Wow, and like no snow, right? Uh, only what's left over from Monday. Wow. Um, yeah, here we've had, we've probably had about two or three feet of snow so far this year already. Um, and there's none on the ground now, but uh, starting tonight, we're going to get about uh, four or five inches again. So it's, it's, it's always interesting. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull down my slides and let me bring up yours. And, um, you know, I'll let you go. You just, you know, you, you know the drill. Slides are up. I'll pull myself down and go ahead. Okay. But Mitch, you're going to advance slides for me. So just go ahead and hit next. And uh, everyone who's with me, um, I'm going to be saying next a lot because I don't have control over the slides themselves, Mitch does. Um, so we're going to talk about some relevance gaps. So Mitch, if you'll just hit next. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm an associate professor of school leadership at the University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, if you're a teacher, you want to get your principal's license, your principal, you want to get your superintendent's license. Those are the classes that I teach. Um, and I work with schools all around the world on school transformation and so on. So you can learn more about me at dangerouslyrelevant.org or I'm on Twitter at, at McLeod, M-C-L-E-O-D. Otherwise, we're going to just keep rolling here. Next. Um, I also am the co-founder of a, the only national center that's focused on the tech needs of school administrators. It's, it's called CASEL. It's co-hosted by CU Denver and the University of Kentucky. So uh, you can find us on the web as well. Next. Um, here is my Twitter ID and also the Twitter ID for EdChat Interactive. And then of course, some fun hashtags we can use as we roll along here tonight. Uh, next, uh, you will need a discussion buddy because we're going to have five or six uh, discussion breaks throughout the next hour where you're going to be asked to pair up with somebody and just chat about some things that I've uh, put before you. So make sure you pair up with folks next. And, uh, There'll be a URL at the end for all these slides, so you don't have to worry about capturing anything as we go along. Otherwise, let's just keep going. Next. Uh, all right, so I think I'm ready to rock and roll. I think you are too. So next. Uh, so Dean Shoresky and I have a new book out. It's called Different Schools for a Different World. It's getting some good reviews, which we're happy about. There's the web address for it if you want to see it. And in that book, next. We talk about how the twin forces of technology and globalization are putting tremendous pressure on a variety of societal institutions, government, 
religion, companies, nonprofits, and of course schools, next. And as the world around us changes quickly, what we're discovering is that there's at least six primary relevance gaps that we can see happening in schools today. Next, we're defining a relevance gap as anything in which society is changing faster than schools are. So um, you can see that space in between there, which is what we're calling a relevance gap. And what we find is that on a number of different fronts, schools are really struggling to keep up with the rapid paces that are happening around us. Next. So uh, tonight, I'm just going to kind of talk about each of those six very briefly um, and then give you a chance to think about those in your own context and converse with, a, with a, a new friend here online. And the first gap I want to talk about is the information literacy gap. Next. So the idea behind information literacy gap is that, of course, we have this new information landscape. We've transitioned from um, ink on paper to digital bits in the ether accessed by mobile devices anytime, anywhere. And the last time we lived through a revolution like this in our information landscape was when we had the printing press. And um, the printing press revolution was really around people's access to information. And now what we have is a revolution in people's ability to not just access information at a vastly larger scale, uh, but also to create and share and participate and uh, be creators of information, not just consumers. Next. So... What we're finding, of course, is that in schools, many places still treat the web as a place where you go get information and pull it down. That's still primarily a consumptive model in many classrooms. Next. Um, and so what we're finding is that we have one gap where, you know, as Mitch Resnick says, you know, we'd never consider somebody literate if they could read but not write. And yet when we talk about information literacy and technology fluency and so on, we still are framing that primarily around consuming information. How do we know things are valid, credible, reliable, and so on? And we're not spending enough time working with students about the need to be powerful creators and connectors and sharers and so on. Next. Um, so that's something to consider. So if you think about our old information landscape, it looks very much like that list on the left-hand side of this slide. And if you think about our new digital bits in the ether landscape, it looks very much like that list on the right-hand side of the slide. And unfortunately, what we're finding is that very few schools are doing a really robust job of preparing students for the dominant information landscape of their time, even though that's one of our primary jobs, uh, because we're not doing very well on many of the things that are on the right-hand side. Next. One of the results of that, of course, is that we're finding that students are, are not just only uh, missing many opportunities to be participants in this space, but even on the consumption side, they're not doing very well in terms of understanding what it means to be critical consumers of the knowledge that's put in front of them uh, through social media websites and so on. Next. So find yourself a discussion buddy and we're ready for our first uh, time discussion. Next. So we're going to give you three minutes to talk about how well are your schools doing at preparing students for the dominant information landscape of their time and what could use some more attention. Three minutes and go. Okay, so you know the drill. Pair up with at least one more person, click on somebody else's avatar, and, uh, and, and discuss with them. If you don't have a microphone, use the text box. Um, that Use the text box icon and, and type in your comments into the text box, and other people will pick up on that and, and respond to you on the text box. But we'll give you three, minute, <laughs> three minutes. And so, Scott, just um, maybe we can call on somebody, and maybe somebody is willing to come up. But, you know, I was going through your list of old versus new, and I see um, the old way being filter and then publish, and the new way being publish and then filter. And is, is it just wishful thinking on my part that maybe we could filter a little bit before publishing? Uh, yeah, I think it is because there are no barriers to anybody having a voice these days, right? We can get on the web in a few clicks and say our piece or establish an online presence. And so we're really going to have to teach the critical skill of filtering afterwards because nobody's filtering for us. Ah, okay. Um, so uh, do you want to, do you, did, did you get a chance to talk to somebody? Do you want to pull somebody up? Or somebody do you want to ask us? Say, otherwise we'll keep rolling. Okay, so um, so there is one person with her hand up, but I don't know if she has her hand up because she wants to come up or because she has a question. So Elena, I'm gonna bring you up. And if it turns out that you have a question, um, 
just let us know. I so, can't hear so, you. Uh, oh, can you hear us now? Yes. Elena? No, I don't have a question. I just don't know how to, ah. to talk to. <laughs> That's fine. No. Okay. Um, All right. Bye, Elena. Okay. Thanks for joining Bye. us. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'll bring myself down and I'll start advancing your slides again. Something. Okay. Next time, I expect a volunteer, though. I just want you all to know. Yeah, everybody's getting used to the system. It's all good. Okay, next slide. Second provocation, new forms of learning. Next. So one of the things we're finding, of course, is that this new information landscape is enabling all kinds of new powerful opportunities for learning. So we've got kindergarteners who are engaged in Twitter chats, connecting with kids all over the globe. Right next, we've got um, kids who are discovering their own asteroids at their school in Nicaragua. Next, we've got uh, kids like this one from Indiana whose assignment was to create a sustainable village on a poster board. And he thought that assignment was so stupid and boring that instead of spending the 90 minutes it would take, he asked his teacher permission and spent what was probably 100 hours plus creating a sustainable virtual village complete with narrated walkthrough and so on in Minecraft. Uh, next, <laughs> we've got... Um, this school in Connecticut who's decided to uh, tell stories from Ovid's Metamorphoses by combining live acting and digital puppets and voiceovers and video game scenes, and they perform them for live audiences at a local theater. They call it Grand Theft Ovid and so on. And so next, we've got uh, stuff happening. And it's not just in the digital realm, right? So when I go to the high school in Colorado, and the culinary arts folks are using the web to raise money for Fort Collins fourth food truck. And they're working with the business and marketing students to figure out what the menu should be and, and market segmentation and publicity and all that stuff. Next, we've got the in the back of the high school, there's a Habitat for Humanity house where they're combining their geometry learning with actually constructing a house and students who have failed algebra three times are aging geometry. Uh, next, we've got uh, my favorite school in Iowa, which is where I used to live for nine years before Colorado. Uh, it's called Iowa Big, where they do all kinds of neat stuff, uh, where they're working on project pools in conjunction with uh, local companies and nonprofits and government agencies. So they develop waterborne drones that measure plastic waste in local rivers and the oceans. Next, they... Uh, design arthritis, arthritis from the utensils. They create a documentary of the county's first medical examiner. Next. They design and test aquaponic systems in North Africa. They use entrepreneurship communities and conferences. Next. They hold hackathons. Next. They build stuff and they test it. Next. They learn essential curriculum through hands-on work and play. Next. They make, they tinker, they explore. Next. So for example, here's a kid who created a recycling bin that tweets out whatever you throw into it. Next. And they've uh, done such great work that they've already come up with at least four uh, intellectual property lines that they're trying to figure out how to protect and market and so on. And they love it, right? Next. So. You know, I think what we're finding here is that there's all kinds of interesting and powerful ways for kids to learn that weren't available to us just a few decades ago. And schools have been pretty slow to catch on to that. And while our youth these days are pretty comfortable in these spaces, particularly using technology to make a lot of this stuff happen, both locally, nationally, internationally, online, and so on. Um, many of us as educators are still struggling to figure out how to tap into these new learning opportunities, both local, face-to-face, -face, and also digital, interactive, online, global, and so on. Next. So back to your discussion buddies, next round of conversation. And the same question I asked before, how well is, are your schools doing with some of these new forms of learning? Uh, and what could use more attention? We'll give you three minutes to chat. Go. Okay, let's bring Scott back. And so, Scott, I, I you know, as you mentioned, what could use some more attention? So, one of the things that keeps on hitting me is, you know, the examples that you're bringing up 
Um, you know, they're, they're a little bit shocking because they're so good, but they're also a little bit shocking because those should be more commonplace. And it seems that the people who are really able to do things like that are very often outliers, that the whole system seems to be stacked against them. Um, but they're willing to brave it because they because that seems to be the right thing to do. But we can't we can't make those commonplace if we keep on penalizing people who try to do those things. So, um, what uh, you know, what are your thoughts? How do we make those types of actions more commonplace? Well, we have 500 plus so-called deeper learning schools across the country these days. These are entire schools, many of them charters that have reoriented themselves around deeper learning, greater student agency, authentic work, and rich tech infusion. Um, but most educators don't have an opportunity to work in one of those schools. I think it's really critical for leaders to create climates of innovation, but also buffer the innovators against the crab buckets, uh, cultures, or tall poppy syndromes that can emerge where anybody who innovates gets renormed back by the rest of the group, right? So, mm -hmm. oh, you're doing stuff that makes me look bad or I feel threatened in some way. So I'm going to start denigrating you or somehow, um, you know, pulling you back towards the rest of us rather than seeing you as the, the innovative trailblazer that you are and supporting that. Um, and that's really the work of strong school cultures and climates and leaders is to buffer those people from sort of those detracting um, comments and climates that can really uh, cause innovators to stop. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, I'm not going to press you, you on that because that, that was a really interesting answer. But I did notice that uh, Joyce and Tom Whitby raised their hand because I, uh, surprise, Great. surprise, I think they may even have a comment or question. What do you got, Tom? <laughs> so, so, Tom, could you speak a little bit louder? Sure. Um, one of my, my major concerns, which is what I tend to focus on, is the idea that most of our educators are products of uh, 19th or 20th century education. Uh, and, and if we're going to change the system and better educate our kids, we have to first better educate our educators. And, and there are too many colleges which are not addressing this, and uh, certainly professional development has not changed in, in a couple of centuries. So it's not addressing it either. We're not teaching adults as adults and, and uh, making professional development a priority in school. I mean, the, the kids easily immerse themselves into, into technology and, and are very adept and, and flexible with working with it and very eager to learn. However, we don't find that with the educators that are supposed to be doing that. Before. So that's, that's yeah. a statement. Yeah, no, and I think we've got big issues there, right? I mean, both our existing professional learning structures in K-12 are woefully inadequate to ramp up most educators to do this work. Um, and then as somebody who works at a university and has done so for two decades, uh, you know, you look at teacher prep and administrator prep, and we're even further behind than K-12 schools most of the time. So we're not preparing new teachers and administrators who have exposure to this stuff, who become fluent in this stuff, and so on. It's a real challenge. So um, yeah, well, uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, let me let me pull you down, and um, I guess we can we can restart the slides. Okay. So I'll actually do the next two together. So we'll do three and four together, um, and then we'll chat again. So third relevance gap is really around student engagement. Some of you have seen the Gallup poll. Um, which comes out every year. Every year they survey like a million students about um, are they engaged in their learning. And of course, we do pretty well holding on to them in elementary school. About three out of four students say they're engaged in their learning, but only about one out of three high school students says that they are. Next. Um, and it's really sort of no wonder why they're not engaged because when you ask them follow-up questions like, in the last week, have you learned anything interesting? Are you having fun? Are you getting to do what you do best? 
And again, particularly in the secondary levels, you know, those numbers are just atrocious. You're lucky if you get one out of five uh, high school students that says yes to some of those questions. Um, and so we have severe engagement gaps um, because students have the ability to be pretty powerful learners at home using these technologies and online spaces. And then they come to school and they see the disconnects. They see that in many ways their learning isn't relevant or that they're being asked to spend 80 to 85% of their time regurgitating stuff that can be found uh, with Google or Siri in just a few seconds. Um, and so we were really struggling, particularly at the secondary levels, to keep kids engaged in what we're asking them to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Next. Uh, so let's go next twice, Mitch, and we'll just go to number four. Um, and so the fourth relevance gap that Dean and I talk about is the economic and workforce preparation. Next. And, you know, it would be one thing if we were uh, somehow despite boring kids out of their minds on a day-to-day -day basis and failing to recognize the new information landscape and failing to take advantage of uh, new learning opportunities, uh, if we were somehow at least preparing them for life success, you know, to get a job, be successful, raise a family, earn enough money for retirement and some amenities and so on. But as you look at offshoring and outsourcing and automation and so on, next, what we're finding is that, of course, we're falling short in these areas as well. And so this slide pretty much sums up what the labor economists tell us. They tell us that um, if you look over the last five, six decades or so, that the only jobs th that are growing in number in America and the rest of the developed world are those jobs that require non-routine mental work. So there's green and blue lines on the screen, right? Non-routine analytical work, non-routine interpersonal social work. And if uh, you have high skills in those areas, the number of jobs that are available to you continue to increase. If you're doing any kind of manual labor or routine mental work, the purple line on the screen, the number of jobs available to you has declined steadily over the past five or six decades and so on. Next. So what we're finding, of course, is that uh, employers, colleges, people who care about citizenship and so on, they're clamoring for people who have these characteristics, right? They're able to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. They're able to effectively communicate and collaborate with others to solve problems. They're self-directed learners. They have tech fluencies. They've got really strong interpersonal skills. They can uh, learn on their own and be meaningful contributors to the organization and, and manage that work and so on. Next. Um, and yet we find that in schools, if you code for day-to-day -day practice at the elementary level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, if you actually go into classes and look at what kids do, 80 to 85% of what they do in most places is factual recall and procedural regurgitation. Again, that kind of stuff you can find in a few seconds with the appropriate digital tools. Next. So uh, next, so we're uh, struggling with, um, how to prepare students for a 21st century global innovation economy in a very outdated school system. And again, just a reminder one last time, it's that <laughs> if we're spending the vast majority of our time, 80% plus in most classrooms on routine mental work and the number of jobs available to you that actually require that is uh, declining steadily and has been for decades. And so our emphasis just seems to be in the wrong place as we think about preparing kids to go out into the world of work and earn money and make a living and support families and so on. Next. So let's group up again and talk about how well is your school doing at preparing kids for the current economic situation of today and in the future, and what could use some more attention? See you in three minutes. Okay, hope you had a good chance to talk to people. I'm wondering, so Scott, you got a chance to talk to people. What were some of the things that people were saying we, when you were talking about um, increasing engagement and or in helping schools, helping kids really prepare for the jobs that are growing? Uh, so we had some technical glitches and then I schmoozed with the whippies for a minute. So um, what I'm finding, however, is that a number of school systems are aware of the disconnects around engagement and around workforce prep. They just don't know what to do or unwilling to do what it takes to close some of those gaps. So, you know, something I'll bet you if Pearson created a test on job readiness, that would solve all of our problems, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so I'll just I'll talk to my friends at Pearson friends and ask them to create a new test. And you know, we'll make it um, multiple choice. It's already out there. It's called work keys or something. Or maybe that's ACT. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you, you and I were text chatting a little bit earlier, and I'm wondering, um, are, is, are there people here who feel that their schools are doing some interesting things that are preparing kids for the, kids jobs, for of the, the future? jobs of the future? And would you be willing to come up on stage? So, um, so if you're or, working in a school, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Or even not just just not boring kids out of their skulls. <laughs> I'd take that. Right. <laughs> so um, so raise your hand and and come on up. Somebody, please. Well, I, I'm going to go. You know, I'm, I, I just bring up something that. Um, so my my daughter is now uh, 28. So, but when she was in fifth grade. Our public school had a program. One teacher ran this, and uh, the program had all the academic subjects were taught Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And all of the non-academic things were crowded into Tuesday. Every Friday, uh, the kids had a field trip. Every six weeks, they picked a different area of the world, and all the lessons for that six weeks were around that period of the of the or around that area of the world. And at the end of the six weeks, every student had to do had to pick a country in that region and create a museum and a recipe and a game about that area. So, um, so, so they were really, you know, that was really project-based learning. The sad thing is, is that the year after my daughter was in the program, the school shut him down because they said he was using too many resources and too many people were were jealous of him. But I will say, you know, it, you don't have to, you don't have to use technology to do this. You can do it other ways, but um, but there are there are some really interesting examples. Uh, Tom uh, raised his hand, or Joyce raised her hand, uh, so I'm going to bring them up uh, to talk to you. Okay, and there's there's Joyce. Okay, so this time it was me. Um, and, and, and when you said that, Tom said, not me, I didn't do it. I'm like, yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're right, Mitch. You know, um, we were talking with um, Clarice, who was on the group there, uh, from Rhode Island. And she had made the point, and we concur, that it, it kind of depends on what teacher you get. And then all of a sudden you had this, the example about your daughter. And I think I found the same thing out with, with my daughter. I work with a lot of schools, have done a lot of consulting with schools on various different software. <clears throat> and we might do pilots for certain things and they're great and people love it and kids are engaged. And then it just kind of, you know, either the teacher gets, a good teacher gets promoted to go do something else or um, the administrator leaves or, and they throw the baby out with the bathwater. And here you had this wonderful little sparkling gem and it, it was a thing of, you know, in, in history. And it's like, wow, how do you keep the continuity? How do you keep something to be really sticky and make it really part of the whole fabric of the school? Scott, I don't know if you have anything, any ideas around that. Well, I mean, most schools don't treat that very seriously, right? So they don't know what to do with that kind of learning at scale. And so they're more than content to have a couple teachers be isolated pockets of innovation or excellence. And otherwise we're gonna keep doing this same old, same old because they haven't reconceptualized their mission or their vision in any way that would require them to go beyond the exception. Yeah, yeah. And and there there are a couple, I, I, I had this one tool um, that was a tool for kids with autism and I know that they're still using it in two big districts in New York City and in Los Angeles, amazing that in these really big districts where we did these little pilots, something caught on and really there was there was a hook and they they kept they continue to use it to this day. It's probably about seven years um, that they've been using this one tool to help kids you know with autism communicate through using visuals on their mobile devices and so forth, but. Goodness gracious, it's it's tough. It's really tough to try and find ways 
to um, to to get that stickiness in there and to keep things going. And I think it's one of the uh, of the biggest challenges that we have. So yeah. my two cents. Okay. Yeah, well, unfortunately, what we're finding is many of the technology tools that do catch on and do stick are the ones that reify and reinforce traditional models of learning and teaching rather than mm -hmm. expand us in new directions, right? And shake so, things up. Right. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, Mitch, thanks. I think you're put us. Okay, so uh, I think that's my cue to keep going. So I'll do number five and number six together too, like we did three and four. We'll just keep rolling along and I'll give you all another chance to chat as I look at the time here. Um, so one of the biggest concerns here is around equity. So as we start moving towards these new kinds of learning environments, uh, we have to ask ourselves, are we remedying inequities or are we exacerbating them? Next. Um, and what we're finding, of course, is that there's all kinds of equity concerns floating around out there. So this is a quote that Dean shared with me from a student, right? Students who get to learn with digital content are lucky, but you shouldn't have to be lucky to learn. Next. And a lot of our traditional conversation around equity has really been around access. It's around getting devices into the hands of students. It's around getting access to uh, broadband and so on. Next. And so schools are definitely doing work on those fronts, right? They're working with their local communities to figure out not only how do we get access to for kids at school, but also at home in their neighborhoods and their schools or communities to create internet kiosks that you can just connect to on the street. Next, they're creating Wi-Fi buses so that kids have connectivity uh, on their long journeys to and from home, and maybe those buses are parked in certain neighborhoods and evenings and weekends and serve as access points. Next, school districts are even serving as their own internet service providers um, to offset some of the costs that might be there if they're working through a local telco instead, and so on. Next, but the Inequities that revolve around usage, not just access, are also really important, and we're not paying near enough attention to those. Next. So, for example, um, you know, uh, many schools are just taking these technologies, even when they do have them, and they're just shoving them into existing classroom models, and we're really not getting the sort of impact or change effect that we hope to. Next. Um, and so we see a lot of people talking about adaptive learning or per so-called personalized learning next. And for many schools, that means that when we pull technology into the learning equation, basically we're going to run them through some kind of adaptive learning software where they push digital content out to you and then you're going to regurgitate it back and it's going to assess how well you answered those questions, mostly low level, multiple choice. Next. Uh, you might even spend hours a day in some kind of kid cubicle working along on this software while uh, a low-paid teacher aide or volunteer paces the room just to make sure that you're on track and not causing trouble. Next. Um, and, you know, what we're finding, of course, is that in many school situations is that traditional inequities just get... Um, reinforced. So the feds, for example, did a study back in 1996 where they said, they asked kids, hey, who, when you use computers in math, how many of you use them primarily for drill and practice work, right? And about 30% of white kids and non-free lunch kids said that they primarily use computers in math class for drill and practice. But then, of course, the percentages for free lunch kids or African-American kids were much higher, you know, um, 5% higher, 20% higher, and so on. Um, and then they did that study again 15 years later, and even though we'd had a decade and a half of talking about closing achievement gaps and 21st century skills and technology equity and so on, those numbers had actually gotten worse. Um, and so for a large percentage of our students, their primary connection with and exposure to and usage of technology, even when the devices and bandwidth are there, are really around reinforcing basic drill and kill work. Um, and so we have these challenges around which kids get to do robust work and which don't. Next. So it's not only a question of who gets to control the computers, which of course is an important question, next, but it's also the larger question, 
around if we want students to do this kind of work, if we want students to connect with others and collaborate and create and doing work that really matters, as Will Richardson says, next, then it's really the bigger question of who really gets opportunities to think and make and create and contribute in these new learning spaces with these new learning tools. And right now we're finding, of course, that many traditional inequities continue to be reified and exacerbated. Um, and so, you know, some kids get to think and make and create and contribute these new tools and other kids get to go through more remediation and the technology forces them into those spaces. And so they fall further behind because they're not only behind on basic skills, but they're not only they're also not gaining the 21st century learning skills that they need to be successful in life. Next. 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 So, uh, you know, the last gap that Dean and I talk about in the book is, uh, is an innovation gap. Next. And so it's this idea that if technology is a given, it's not a debate. Next. If uh, these tools and environments are creating powerful uh, learning opportunities that were never available to us before, next. Uh, then we have to ask ourselves some really hard questions, such as why are we blocking most of this stuff out in our classrooms and in our school districts? Uh, next, um, how do we uh, somehow adjust to the fact that all of the traditional structures of schooling, like grades and subjects and time blocks and subject isolation silos and isolation, you know, have very little relevance in this new information landscape? Next. Um, how do we start thinking outside of the box as systems, right? Rather than continuing to pretend that we ask kids to think outside the box, but cram them into existing structures. Next. Um, and, you know, so take a look at this list for a minute. So, you know, we've got all of these assumptions about what school should look like. Um, everything from students can't be trusted to be that exams are the best criteria for judging student success, that if we present information that's the same as teaching and it's the same as learning, that somehow we're going to get creative adults from passive students and so on and so on. And then recognize that that set of assumptions, as well as others, right, has been around with us a long time. I mean, that list right there comes from Carl Rogers in 1969. So that's, you know, a good 50 years back. Uh, next. And so I think, you know, it's tough for us. We say we want these kind of graduates. We want them to be creative innovators who can manage their own time and to be self-directed self-learners, blah, blah, blah. Next. And yet we're still asking 17-year-olds uh, to ask permission to go to the bathroom, right? And in these kind of environments where they're heavy on compliance and punishment um, and the status quo, and if you deviate, then woe be it to you. Uh, it's very unsurprising if we don't see any kind of risk-taking or innovation happening here. Next. And so, you know, John Spencer talks about this idea that when are we going to start shifting from students answering somebody else's questions to instead asking questions that drive our own learning forward. Next. And of course, as uh, Wellman states, you know, here we are, we've got a two century old curriculum, we've got a one century old buildings in many cases, and we've got current students who are looking around and saying, what the heck, you know, none of this fits. We don't know where we're going um, in terms of of life or learning environments or workforce and so on, and our systems are just struggling to adapt. Next. So as uh, David Warlock says, no generation history has ever been so thoroughly prepared for the industrial age, and yet we don't live in an industrial age anymore in most places. Next. So, uh, of course, these relevance gaps continue to accrue as we continue to adapt and innovate much slower than society around us and is provoking, it's providing a real challenge for us. Next. So let's do one more round of discussion and then we'll come back and talk and then we'll wrap it up. So next slide. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, so think about equity issues and think about speed of innovation, right? How quickly is your school adapting to these new environments? your local area, and what could use some more attention. Have a good chat. Here he is, and you're back. Uh, so now you've got about you know two minutes, three minutes to bring it all home and solve all six issues, <laughs> unless somebody is willing to come up and talk about them with you. 
So, um, so, so show us the way. Okay. So how do we close some of these gaps? Next, well, as my good friend Will Richardson says, if you're comfortable with education today, you're not paying much attention, next. Um, and so as I referenced at the beginning of all of this, right, we've got these twin forces, technology and globalization that are really putting tremendous pressure on everything, next. And we've got a number of relevance gaps that we as schools and communities are struggling to close, next. Uh, one of the ways we do that is we start asking ourselves some really hard questions about what kind of schools do we want next? Do we want schools in which students are recipients of prepackaged chunks of information that get delivered to them while they sit passively, pre-made, and so on? Next. Or do we want bakers and makers and creators and doers, students who are actively engaged in their learning and doing awesome things that hopefully make a difference in their world? Next. And if we want those kind of students, then what are we willing to do to get them? What are we willing to do to get those kinds of schools? Next. So part of it is just really a really robust inward conversation within a community and within a school about what kind of learning do we want to make happen and what kind of schools we want to make happen. You know, uh, stealing a couple slides from Will Richardson, you know, he asks people all the time, under what conditions do you learn most productively? In school, out of school, wherever. And they usually come up with something that looks like the list on the left. Next. And it never, ever looks like the list on the right. Um, next. And so the biggest challenge for us in schools is how do we create more of the stuff that's happening on the left side of the screen and less of the stuff that's happening on the right side of the screen? And how we navigate those tensions and reconcile those two sides of the screen is really the path forward, right? But it starts with a a willingness to look inside as an organization and as a community and really have those tough conversations about what does society require of our school today and tomorrow. Next. Um, we're also, you know, it's important to remember that if you want school to be different, you have to design for it. Next. It just isn't going to just happen magically. And so I talk with uh, schools a lot about four primary shifts, the shifts towards, uh, Mitch, go back one. Um, shifts towards deeper learning and student agency and authentic work and rich tech in, uh, infusion next, because we know that you're not going to get higher level thinkers from low level thinking spaces, right? Like it's just not going to happen. And we know in our hearts that the uh, next, that the best learning experiences are hands-on and applied, you know, immersed in the real world, not disconnected and isolated next. We know that true deep learning is rarely linear. It's almost never neatly organized by chapters and sections. Next, we know that authentic, powerful learning rarely takes the form of a worksheet or an end of chapter review problem or a multiple choice quiz. Next. And so somehow we have to get past the read this, next, answer these pedagogical model, right? Which is what dominates in most schools. We have to fall out of love with our own voices and enable those of our students instead. Next. We've got to get out of our comfort zones because that's really where the magic happens. And if we do that next, we have the ability to give kids wings. So, you know, as I wrap this up, I'm just going to say, you know, how seriously is your school and community treating those four big shifts? The shift from lower level recall to deeper learning. And we have lots of schools that have paved the way in that direction. How seriously is your school treating the shift from teacher-dominated and directed learning environments to those in which students have more agency and control and ownership of their own learning, which of course helps a ton with engagement? How seriously are we treating the shift from isolation and disconnection to authentic work? And then finally, of course, how do we use technology uh, not only in its own right, because we live in a digital world, but how do we use technology to make those first three shifts happen? How do we pull technology into our classroom spaces in ways that allow deeper learning and agency and authentic work to occur in a variety of new ways and more powerful ways than would be possible without it? And those are really the conversations that schools around the country are having, at least some of them. Um, and that's where most of the exciting work is these days and where I'm living. So uh, if you'll hit the next slide, Mitch, I'll just say that, um, you know, I think that's important work. I hope that some of you will join me in that and see the value in that. And we'll just uh, wrap this up and chat for as long as you want.
So that's it. Thanks. Next slide. If somebody were, uh, obviously they could go to your website, but um, you know, if somebody really felt that they wanted to make a difference in their school um, and they wanted you to come and speak to their school, is that something that you would do? Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, just get in touch. We'll figure it out. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, or I they work, could, I work yeah. teachers and principals and parents and school boards and policymakers all the time. So. And would reading the book help? Uh, yeah, because then you'd have some ammunition to help make the case locally, right? So we've I've had a number of school districts that have chosen the book as a book study for their educators, their PTA, their school board, whatever. Um, and are trying to use the book as a lever to spark some conversations that they're not having. So that that might be kind of the the quick way to get started, and then once they start getting momentum, then to kind of bring you out um, to to yeah. get them moving faster in in the direction. Because I, I think that that we're really at the point in education. And by the way, anybody else who wants to come in, come up and just uh, talk about this with us, just raise your hand and, and, and we'll bring, we'll bring you up also. But it, it seems to me, you know, if, if you, uh, the, the, the four steps towards, uh, towards real learning first, um, unconscious incompetence, you know, where you don't really, you don't even know what you don't know. And then conscious incompetence, where is that to me, like, that's the that's the most important step because as soon as I know that I don't know something, I can learn it. But if I don't even know that I don't know it, then I'm just going blissfully aware, doing unaware, doing something that's wrong. And then after you know, uh, conscious incompetence comes conscious competence, where you have to think about doing it, and then finally conscious competence, where you, you're doing it correctly. And I think that we're finally at the point where there's there seems to be a critical mass of people who understand that that's, things have to change. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think, you know, the reason Dean and I wrote the book is just really to sort of help people frame wh why we need to change in sort right. of six key areas that people could wrap their head around, right? Rather than sort of this amorphous, oh, we need to change. Well, here's why. Like we're, we see a serious disconnect here and we see a serious disconnect here and we see a serious disconnect here, right? And, mm -hmm. and one of the things we do in the book is we talk further about those four big shifts and how, how to operationalize some of them. We give some examples of schools that are starting to close some of these gaps and what they do, right? We give little school profiles and so on. Mm -hmm. um, because this is complex work. You know, and this is very difficult leadership work. It's very difficult instructional work. It's very difficult and complex community conversation work, and yet it has to be done. Well, and nothing ever, nothing good ever came easy, anyhow. And you always feel better after you work hard on something and it works. So, if you, um, if you could leave this, you know, with like a parting shot, or maybe you know. That, that, that you'd want people to take away or people watching the, the, the archive of this to take away, uh, what will you say to people as your parting paragraph? I would say that what has been fascinating to me is that as you look at these 500 or so deeper learning schools across the country, not only are they closing many of these gaps, their students also are doing better on traditional assessment measures than traditional schools. In other words, if you talk to these schools, they'll freely admit that they're covering less content, and yet their students are doing better on standardized assessments of content coverage than ours are. And concerns that educators raise about accountability mandates and our kids have to do well on the X, Y, or Z test, whatever, these environments are doing better on those tests because they're able to focus on what's really important in the curriculum and they go deep, deep, deep on it rather than shallow and broad. And so if there's a ray of hope for anybody who's trying to figure out how do they move this direction while simultaneously handling current accountability concerns, uh, maybe that's the ray of hope. Hmm. And are can you just, you find them just, you can query 500 deeper learning schools or just deeper learning schools? Um, I've actually, given links to those schools in the resources. So if you ah. just go to the website, go to the website, you can find out more about the research behind some of these places, go investigate some of these schools and so on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Fascinating. Okay. Well, um, Scott, uh, you know, thank you. 
Um, thanks, thanks for coming on EdChat Interactive. Uh, thanks for a very uh, stimulating discussion. Some, you know, a, a different way of thinking about change and the gap between where schools are and where schools themselves want to be than um, than, than I had been aware of, and I'm sure you know everybody else, everybody who attended. Um, and watches the archive will will we'll come away learning a lot also. So thank you so much, and uh, hope hope to see you in person soon. I, you said you'll be at ISTE in 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 June. I'll be at ISTE as well. So so maybe we'll see you there. And um, you know, have a good rest of the evening. Thanks everybody so, for joining us tonight. Take care. Okay, and this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. I hope to see you all uh, in February at uh, one of our events, either the one on February 7th where we're um, recapping or going deeper into the EdChat hashtag, uh, what was discussed the previous night, or on February 13th, I think it is, when we're having uh, the people from the Friday group come back and do another session on uh, transforming student learning. So good night and hope to see you soon.